Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you, church pastors, for having me come in this evening. Um, it's an honor to be finally here at your church. It's kind of surreal. It's kind of it's it's a moment in my life. I'm taking this whole evening in because back in 1992, when I was in high school, my first missions trip out of the United States was to Russia and Belarus. I was 16 years old, and I was attending a church, and they wanted to go on a missions trip to Belarus, but we flew into Moscow first, and we spent a couple days in Moscow, then got on the train, and took the train all night to Minsk, Belarus, and yeah, hallelujah. we spent a week in Minsk and doing a camp for kids. And um, to tell them about Jesus, we worked with a missionary named Steve Hill um, at the time. And on that trip it was when God touched my life in Belarus and it told me that one day I'll be a full-time missionary. And, and I was just a wreck. I, on the plane ride back to the United States, I was just, I couldn't stop crying. I just, I was, you know, the people... And Russia and Belarus were so hospitable, so nice. And I just saw the love of Christ in them. And I also saw the need for missions. And God did a work back in 1992 in Russia. And now I hit, in 2017, I'm at a Russian church. And I feel really, part of me wants to speak Spanish tonight. You know, and I hear the, the broken English and I just want to start speaking Spanish, but that's not going to work tonight. Um, but I love missions focus, so thank you for having tonight be a little different. I know you normally have a prayer night, but there's nothing like a missions focus. Like he said, uh, my wife and I, and along with three kids, if you haven't received a prayer card before you leave, take one of these. Um, please pray for us. But that's my family, Ken and Kendra, and we have three kids, Caden, Caleb, and Kiana. And Kiana and my wife, they are already back in Nicaragua. Nicaragua is a country in Central America. It's a smaller country. It's only the size of the state of New York. Um, six and a half million people live in the country, but it's very poor. It's the second poorest country on this side of the globe. Everyone knows that Haiti's poor. Yeah. Number, number two is Nicaragua. But my wife flew back Sunday afternoon because she had a meeting um, today, actually, with, with the office, the president's office of the whole country, the, the, the presidential office, office of Nicaragua, asked for a meeting, and it went very, very well. And later on in my little spiel, I'll explain what that meeting was all about. God has given us favor with the government officials, which is very interesting because the government um, is interesting. I'll explain that later as well. But my boys, Caden and Caleb, they're 15 and 14. I'm going to pick them up in Maine tomorrow, and we fly back Friday. But we have been stateside for four months. Last, We haven't been stateside since 2011. So when we flew here in April, I had culture shock. <laughs> Driving, we've driven 19,000 miles in four months in the United States. Every state east of the Mississippi, we have driven in and visited churches. Tell them about Nicaragua. But I have had culture shock here in the states. I know God has called me to Nicaragua. But tonight, I am so glad and fortunate to be with you. Hopefully, you can understand my English. Uh, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, grew up in Ohio. I was on staff at a church in Detroit, Michigan for eight years. I was a pastor there for eight years before full-time missions in 2007. Um, but before I go any further, I want to show you our first video. It's the, um, it's the recap video. And I want to share this video because this church, as many of you, there's some of you in this, this church. Hold on one second. Yep, that's my family. Can you pause it for a second? Woo! There you go. Some of you in this church, like he said, um, went on a missions trip with the radio Q99.7, I believe. 
And yeah. um, you guys have been following us on Facebook and have been praying for us there and what we do there. And we want to show you this first video. Hopefully you can understand the words of my wife because you guys have played a huge part. If you prayed for us, if you have given, I mean, you guys went and sacrificed and did a camp. And it's not about my wife and I. It's about the kingdom, right? Amen. And what... All of us are doing for the Lord. So you guys play a huge part of what God is doing in Nicaragua, and we don't take that for granted. And I'm just glad that I am here in person to say thank you. So let's watch this video and just rejoice in what God is doing, how God is using your church in Nicaragua. Then you play. The words thank you will never be enough to express our thanks to each of you. You have literally traveled with us down river and dug out canoes into remote indigenous communities who have never heard the name of Jesus. You have walked through these dark and lonely streets, rescuing abandoned children. You have hiked hours up mountains to visit churches where no missionary has ever gone before. And you have scavenged through the dumps of Nicaragua alongside of us as we have preached salvation and healing to the forgotten. You have been hand in hand with us as God has helped us to reach the least of these. You have helped us to build 15 churches and children's centers. The most recent being Casa de Adoración, which means house of worship, and is located just outside the garbage dump where we have seen four physical miracles and more than 50 people come to know Jesus this past year. You have helped us provide camps where thousands of children were bused across the country for a three-day encounter with the one and only Jesus Christ. You continue to help us provide warm meals for more than 35,000 children every day that suffer from hunger and malnutrition. Children who face greater trials and tragedy on a daily basis than most of us will experience in a lifetime. You helped us get thousands of children into school through the Uniform Project, who now have an opportunity to receive an education and rise up out of the cycle of poverty they live in. In 2010, we launched Engage Nicaragua where God has entrusted us with equipping more than 40 young people to pursue the calling God has put on their lives. Today, more than 50% of these students have already been approved by Assemblies of God World Missions and are now currently pursuing missionary assignments. You were with us during the flooding in Alamecamba and during Hurricane Otto when it hit Nicaragua. As our team traveled long and far to be the first responders to the people devastated by the effects of these natural disasters, you were there. You crossed rivers on cargo boats and dangerous waters, carrying relief supplies, and most importantly, the word of God, to the people who had lost all hope. Together, this is what we've done, and all in the name of Jesus Christ. In 2015, a dream God placed in our hearts many years ago began to become a reality. We stepped out in faith to purchase these 26 acres of land in Chiquilistagua, Nicaragua, soon to be a place of refuge for children and a missions leadership training center where young people will be equipped to go to the ends of the earth. You have put every available resource in our hands and encouraged our hearts. You have prayed for us fervently and given sacrificially. We have seen God effectively use you to help fulfill the Great Commission. May God bless each of you beyond measure, and may He multiply your every sacrifice. And like the words of this song, may your prayer for us be that they will see Jesus in all that we do. A little bit about 
what is going on in Nicaragua, but you guys have played a huge part of that. You came on a team and have prayed for us. It's about the body of Christ. And I love missions focus as a reminder to all of us that we all play a part. It, when you read in the Bible in Acts chapter 1, how when the, Jesus ascended into heaven and everyone was looking at Jesus go up, that God had to send a couple angels like, why are you standing looking in the sky? <laughs> now go and do what I asked you to do, which was go make disciples. And I feel in my heart that this church gets it. You guys are going and making disciples. And so thank you for those that came to Nicaragua and did a camp and love on the people. And rumors has it that um, Q99.7 is planning a trip for next year. Woo. So if you uh, feel like, I want to go on a missions trip, uh, um, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen next year. But, um, but missions plays a huge, huge part. And with our family, my kids were age 2, 4, and 5 when we moved to Nicaragua. And we went to this country because God put on a heart to go. We didn't think we were going to go to Central Africa, Central, Central America. We thought we were going to go to Africa. We ministered to a lot of Muslim people in the um, Dearborn, Hampshire, Detroit area. Um, we actually were close friends with some Muslim Egyptians. And we thought maybe the Lord was calling us to Egypt. But when the God put in our heart, now is the time to go to full-time missions, we didn't have our peace. And all of a sudden, one day in Nicaragua, we couldn't shake Nicaragua. And my wife and I, we've been to 30 different countries, but we've never been to Nicaragua. We're like, what? And so we went to Nicaragua just to see what, was, what God was doing in our hearts. And as soon as we got there, we were overwhelmed with peace and joy. And we saw the huge, huge need. There's so many people were just neglected. And tonight, we don't have time to tell you all the stories. I mean, and it's not about the details of the story. It's about Christ and what he's doing because Jesus is enough. And I'm sh sure in this room tonight, you can sh share with me your stories or tell me some stories that will make me be like, oh, wow. But we, we all know tonight that God sits on the throne. That he, he is in control. That nothing is impossible. That Jeremiah 29, 11, that how God has a plan for us, a hope and a future, wasn't just written for us here. It was written for everyone around the world. But to be honest with you, when we got to Nicaragua and we saw some of the things we saw, we could not comprehend it. I could not wrap my, my mind around what I saw and experience. We were walking to garbage dumps like this. Why do we go to garbage dumps? Half the population, 50% of the population in Nicaragua today, in 2017, lives on less than $1 a day. 70% lives on less than $2 a day. These people, they live by this dump or in this dump. And what they're doing is they're looking for any recyclables, whether it's nails, whether it's plastic or metal. And they can gather that in, they can cash that in. They can look, they can work 12 hours for three straight days just for a couple dollars. And so we go in there just trying to be the hands and feet of Christ. What would Jesus do? You know? Because um, sometimes it's, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so we just want to walk alongside of them and help them dig through the trash. It gives us a right to speak into their lives. We just share the goodness, the hope we have in Christ. But there's a lot of needs. For example, the same dump here. We have this little buddy of ours. He loves my wife. Um, he's eight years old. And one day we showed up in this garbage dump. And we saw our little buddy unconscious under cardboard in the dump. And my wife went over there, took the cardboard off of him, and, and started cleaning him up. He had a head wound. And, um, like, turned out he was, in, he was like that for two straight days. But we knew where he lived, so we took him to his, his shack, dirt floor. It's like eight feet by eight feet dirt floor, and they use plastic or corrugated steel as a side. We walk in, and there was his sister, who was like 13. And we're like, 
Why hasn't anyone looked for your brother? He's been knocked out under garbage for the last two days. Because what happened was, when garbage trucks come into the dump, these people will run and jump on the truck and they stab the trash with sticks. Basically claiming that trash so they have rights to dig through it. And one day, our buddy, he fell off the trash truck and hit his head somehow and knocked himself out. And someone actually put cardboard over him so he's protected by the sun. But we were so upset, like how can you just let this little boy be in this dump? But in this house stood his sister who's age 13. She's holding an 18 month old baby that was crying, which is, wasn't her baby, it was her, her little sister. Then her other little brother who's like three years old is playing by her leg. Then her other six-year-old sibling is in the corner playing. Six kids in this tiny shack. Mom's not around because she's a prostitute. She doesn't want to look for garbage. So what she does for money, she sells herself to the guys dropping off trash. And dad's not in the picture at all. Then it dawns on me, like us, my wife and I are like, we don't have the answers. But Jesus has to be enough. You know, we live in this world where sometimes it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. I moved 15 times before I graduated high school. I'm from a broken family in Ohio. Um, my mom remarried to a guy who was an alcoholic. He would come home from the bars and just beat me. And I don't understand why I grew up in a home like that. But I know God has a plan for my life, a hope and a future. It reminds me of a story in the book of Mark, chapter 10. And I'm just going to reference these scripture verses, and I'm going to tell more stories about Nicaragua. Mark, chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. You may know the story. It's about a blind guy outside Jericho. He heard that Jesus was coming by. And what did he do? He cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. It's that story, Mark, chapter 10. And Jesus was passing by Jericho on his way to Jerusalem to be the ultimate sacrifice, right? And the people around Jesus was telling this guy, shh, be quiet, don't, don't. But that, this guy was so desperate. He was so desperate. He didn't care. He cried even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. And what did Jesus do in the scripture verse? Jesus stops. Verse 49, and Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And that's basically my wife and I's heartbeat in Nicaragua. We're just trying to tell people to take heart, have hope. We're trying to tell the people in Nicaragua to get up, rise up, rise up, because God is calling you. Jesus could very easily tell told that blind guy, I'm on my way to die for you, but I'm, about to, I'm on my way to die for you, and, and three days later, rise again. But he didn't just say that. He said, what can I do for you? And the blind guy goes, I want to see. And he was healed. And I share that because Jesus loves us so much that he wants to touch us. I'm sure he has touched your life and your family at one time or another. Aren't you glad that Jesus continues to touch our lives? We're so blessed to be here tonight and worship God freely. You know, we can play our instruments and we can go outside these doors and tell people about Jesus and have freedom to worship. Also, I'm so blessed that if we're frustrated or scared or depressed or we're sick, we can call the name of the Lord and he's here to touch us. He can heal us and set us free and give us joy and give us peace. There was, um, there was mention tonight about a healing outside this dump and because of this healing, there's a church. I want to show a video of my wife talking to this guy, Maximo. <laughs> Hi, I'm missionary Kendra out here in Nicaragua, and today I just want to introduce you to
to my friend Maximo, and he has an awesome testimony that he's going to share with us today. Maximo, will you tell us the testimony of your friend? Okay, the friend is here. He's here to About 10 days ago, I was fatal and I couldn't walk with my right leg was hurting me so bad. And I, all I could do was I felt like crying and I asked two of the, the young ladies that were with our team if, if they could pray for me. And so they looked for another lady and another man to pray with me also. They began to pray for me. I felt so happy that in my heart I really trusted the prayer that they were giving to the Lord. And, and I believe that God was going to help me and give me strength in my legs so that I could stand up and begin to walk. We, we prayed for about eight minutes. I felt like in my leg it began to burn a little bit. And, and then I began to get strength in my leg and I began to um, stand up a little bit, but I wouldn't be able to walk. And we prayed for two more minutes. Then she, she, she began to close the prayer, asking God to please, to please help him. And so that he would strengthen the leg and give it mobility so that he could be able to walk immediately. So I, so I took a couple of steps. I could, I could feel a little bit more strength in my leg that maybe I was going to be able to walk. I want to give thanks to God first and for the three people who took the time to pray for me. And so then after they left, I began to walk and I looked for my um, cart, my horse and, and cart. And I began to walk. I didn't ride the horse, and I walked my way all the way to Rivas, which is about five kilometers from here. He had his bag of rice that was donated over his shoulder, and the bag of uh, recyclables that he had looked for for that day. And he walked all the way to Rivas. Sábado, creo. Uh -huh. And so a few days ago when we came to visit and minister here in the dump, um, he looked for the girls that prayed for him and he began to tell them that, I, that my leg is only a little bit weak now but now I can walk well. <laughs> Amen. And then he said, and he wanted to give thanks to God because now because of God's strength that he had put into his leg, that now he could walk everywhere. And, and I want to tell you that I'm really grateful too for the rise that you've given and provided for us these weeks. Because I can feel the prayers that you're praying for me, whether it be here or there. <laughs> I'm going to continue to pray and believe God to heal my leg completely so I can walk all the way to the United States. <laughs> He couldn't walk. He got hit by a taxi. And for over a few years, he was paralyzed. Could not walk. And one day, he heard that there was a group of people praying for people in the dump. So he made a way...
to go to the dump by on the back of a horse and buggy cart to get prayed for. And he got healed. God touched him. He restored those, his legs and started to walk. And that was the start of a ripple effect of what God did miraculously in that community. Because I stand in front of you today and say, yes, we've been missionaries in Nicaragua for 10 years. And we went there just to serve the people, to love the people, to tell people about Jesus. But we didn't know exactly how it was going to be. Some things came easy. Some things were more difficult. And working that dump, we worked there for two years. Not a single person came to know the Lord. No one got saved. No real conversion. For two years of walking alongside the people, sharing our testimonies. But one day, Maximo, who couldn't walk, showed up. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in your God. But if you guys keep on insisting that he loves me and that he can heal, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> and so we prayed for him. And 20 minutes after we actually left the dump area, my wife got a phone call. And on it was the, some, one of my wife's friends said, what? Maximo's Hill, he's walking around. He was so excited that God touched his legs that he walked four miles into town, like the video said. Then that same day that we shot that video, he asked my wife, now where can I go to, to worship the God that has healed me? And my wife's like, um, uh, we didn't make any plans. We, no, we didn't see any conversions for two years, so we didn't have any plans to build a church. We built over 15 churches in that country. But, but we're like, okay, Maximo, very good question. So we have a, um, a pastor friend of ours. We contacted that church and had him send a pastor to the dump every week for eight months. They met under a tree and had their church service under a tree. And that gave us enough time for us to raise the funds. We actually raised the funds, and like two months later, we had a tw over $20,000. We built a beautiful church um, right there at this. By the entrance of the dump, there was a church. And this last February, we had the inauguration service. And it seats 300 people. It was packed with 300 people. There's 54 people that, that got saved now, that went through discipleship, that had been water baptized. There had been four physical healings. And it all started with this guy, Maximo, that was desperate. That was desperate for God. Kind of reminds me of Mark chapter 10, that blind guy. He didn't care what people were saying. He was going to call out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And I just want to share that with you tonight, because I don't know your story. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe it's in your home, in your marriage, at work. And, but God's here. Be desperate for Him. Because He loves us so much that He wants to continue to touch our lives. Another thing I see out of this scripture verse in Mark chapter 10, because it says, take heart and you know, have hope. You know, that should encourage us. When the Savior of the world calls us to come to, law, to Him, that should give us hope, right? But it also says, rise up. Sometimes we like to play the victim card. What I mean by that, sometimes we're like, oh, I'm just this way because of my past. Because if you just know my history, where, where I'm from, it's never going to change. It's always going to be this way. We like to live in this victim mentality. And we come across that a lot in Nicaragua. It's, it's a very poor country. 60% of the kids, they don't go past 6th grade. 6th grade's it. 6 out of 10 kids, they stop at 6th grade. For a lot of different reasons. One, they, they need to have a school uniform. School's free, but they have to have a uniform. Okay? Um, and they have like 10, 12 kids, you know? They start having kids when they start to have kids. Kids are raised in their, when they're 13, 14, they start having kids, lack of education. And so 
they can't afford to have school uniforms for all their kids. Another other reasons why is secondary education from 7th grade through 11th grade, there's not as many buildings, so they may have to take the bus to get to it, but they are too poor to pay the bus fee. Or grandmother or mom wants them to work to make tortillas. And so they say, don't go to school. We need you to work. For example, there's a story. One of our feeding centers, and I, I haven't said this already, uh, we have over 290 feeding centers in the country of Nicaragua right now. We went there just to say, God use us. And over a course of 10 years, we have now over 290 different feeding points in the whole country. We provide food for over 38,000 kids. Each day at noon gets food at one of our feeding centers. But it's not just about feeding the kids, right? Because they can have full bellies. And if they don't know Christ, we can walk them straight to hell. We can put clothes on their backs and get them school uniforms, which we provide school uniforms. Last year we put over 1,500 kids back into school. But we can get them into school, but if we don't tell them about Jesus, we're walking them straight to hell. It has to be about Jesus. And Jesus is enough. But one, one of our feeding centers, which is right in the capital city, Managua, it, it, at one time this was the largest open air dump in Central America, where 3,000 people lived in the dump. 2,000 were kids, okay? Um, right now it's all cleaned up. Um, thanks, Spain is helping out with that. They got some bad press from like 2020 or Dateline. But what, they, what the government did is they took the people out and like 20 miles outside the capital, they just dumped them on this, this land and just gave them a little six by six piece of property. But we have feeding centers there. Um, but we have a feeding center by the dump and this one little boy had open wounds on his body that wouldn't heal. So we took him in for a couple of weeks to give him medicine and take him out of his environment. He, his, his mom died of AIDS. His dad got ran over by a garbage truck when he was sleeping in the dump. Uh, he, he has to live with his grandmother. His grandmother has to raise 10 kids. In, in, in. They actually have 26 people in this house. That's probably, I don't know, 20 feet by 20 feet. It's a little bigger shack, but 26 people live in it. And he was the youngest. And he has to share one plate of food with one other kid. That's the only thing he ate all day. And so in the country of Nicaragua, where the culture is only the strong survives, well, he ended up finding his food on the streets or in the garbage. And because of that, he got sick and had open wounds. We took him in to our house to clean him up. But we wanted him to go back after his wounds are all cleaned up. But the, the grandmother said, said, no, we don't want him back. Please, keep him. We don't want him back. Long story short, we got him into an orphanage. He's taken care of. He's actually going to school. He has the best grades of his class. But that's the culture. That's, that's Nicaragua. That's, you know, over half the population. That's their situation. And a lot of them... It's like, well, I'm this way. I'm a, you were born in Pennsylvania in the United States. I was born in a garbage dump. You know? And I can't, what, what do I say then? You know? Even my boys, uh, my kids were two, four, and five when we left for the mission field back in 2007. And in 2011, we came back for six months to raise support for our budget. And um, one of my boys, wow, United States is rich. Look, the dogs even have houses. You know, the dog, it, it was just a new concept, seeing things through their perspective. Like, that's a good point. But Jesus has to be enough. We need to count our blessings. But Jesus is enough. He, we are more than conquerors. You know, God, Jesus has a plan for my life. A hope and a future. And it wasn't just written for us here. It was written for the kids and the people of Nicaragua. So that's our message. And it is. And God is moving. God is touching lives in kids. 
And if my wife was here, she would tell you a beautiful story. Uh, my wife and I are complete opposites. You know, I, I'm, I look like I'm bald. I, I struggle up here. My wife has beautiful long hair. I get to the point really quick. My wife tells a beautiful story. You know, do you guys know what Cold Stone ice cream is? Yeah. Okay. I tell people, with me tonight, it's like you guys are going to Cold Stone ice cream and all you get is a Cold Stone with maybe just a little vanilla. That's it. If my wife was here, she brings all the flavors and she's, she's just a super anointed. She's, she's an amazing storyteller, so I, I do apologize. You just need to come to Nicaragua so you can uh, meet her. But she's not here tonight because um, most of everything that we do in Nicaragua is in my name. But the, the feeding containers, the, we have over 30 containers of food that come to us in Nicaragua. And all that is being cleared under my wife's name. And um, she had to go back because the president's office asked for a meeting with my wife. Why did they ask for a meeting? Um, not to bore you, but you need to understand this. You might understand this. That's the president, the current president of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega. He's been in office since 2005. Okay, he's been there for 12 years. He's changed the constitution so he can be in office basically for life. His wife is now the vice president. Okay, he. That kind of, it's more of a socialist communist government right now, and everything is slowly getting kind of controlled, kind of like the frog that's slowly getting boiled. You guys know that analogy? So last year, the government changed a lot of regulations, and um, which caused us to, like every person coming in, I had to give passport numbers, and I had to give hourly reports on where we're going to be. This is like months, September, October, November. Things were slowly changing for the worse. And, um, and the Evangelical Association, all the evangelical pastors in the country, rose up and said, no, no, we're not going down this path. And so it was a strong tension last fall, but they had a meeting. And out of the meeting, the government said, we will do what we want to do. We don't need to tell you what, why and what we're doing. However, we'll try to work with you. Submit two people's names out of the whole country that the government will work with, that you feel will make the biggest impact. We're not going to work with every church, you know. We don't like church, basically. But we'll work with two individuals. One was this pastor, a Nicaraguan pastor of a fairly large church, like 6,000 plus people. Huge Nicaraguan church. And the other person's name was my wife's name. And so, um, since January, the, the president's office has helped us, like diplomatic immunity type of things with our containers, no questions asked, the favor of God. Um, and so they called for a meeting, which was today, and um, it went very, very well. It's interesting, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, um, if you read scripture, Daniel, Joseph, the coat of many colors, a lot of times, um, men and women of God, God shows their favor upon them in the midst of an interesting situation for such a time as this. And uh, we just try to keep the main thing, the main thing, which is Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. And um, so that's why she's not here. But if she was here, she would tell you a story about a little girl named Josefa. Josefa is 14 years old right now. And she's one of our girls in our feeding programs. And um, we do a lot of things in the country. We build churches. We do, I, I've taught at the Bible college. We do um, Bible institutes. We do medical clinics. We do construction. Um, just anything that would give God glory and help the people rise up. And so we also do this program called Rise Up, where we take boys and girls that we see potential in them, and they can travel with us, and they can get ministry experience. 
And one day, my wife was at a feeding center and saw Josefa sitting on some rocks and telling kids Bible stories. And so my wife went up to Josefa and said, wow, you really do have a passion to tell the kids about Jesus. And she replied to my wife, yes, this is what I'm called to do. This is my pur purpose in life. My wife's like, wow, that's a very mature. And we have, we provide food for over 38,000 kids, but we don't know their stories. So we got to know Josefa a little bit, and we invited Josefa, how about you travel with us? Every other weekend, our college students, because we have a program in Nicaragua where um, college-age students can come to Nicaragua and experience missions and do online classes at any university they want to. They can come from Russia, over. They can come from Spain, over. United States, over. They do online classes. Outside their classes, they experience missions. Because you can do anything for 10 days, right team? You can take cold showers for 10 days. You can not flush your toilet paper. When you come to Nicaragua, they don't flush your toilet paper. My daughter was two years old when we went there. And when we came back in 2011, or the first time or something, we were at a hotel, and all I hear was like, ah! But my daughter was crying, like freaking out. I'm like, I go into the bathroom, I'm like, what's wrong? And she, her underwear's down to her ankles, and she's holding toilet paper, like, ah! she, she did not know where to throw it away. Because in Nicaragua, there's a trash can, you just, you know, you put your toilet paper in that. I'm like, no, this is United States. You can flush your toilet paper. That's how awesome the United States is. She's like, no. I was like, yes, you're allowed. No. <laughs> but anyways, um, Josefa, um, she says, you can do anything for 10 days, but to live abroad and go through culture shock, it kind of clarifies God's calling on your life. So we invite Josefa, this 14-year-old 14 14-year-old girl, um, to travel with our college students every other weekend for three days, every other weekend, to go and minister. And, uh, and she did this for a couple months. And after a couple months, my wife says, okay, Josefa, it is your turn to go and give a testimony. I can't do that. I'm only called the kids. And she's like, no, 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 you can do this. You've been watching us. Um, and at this time, we're outside in another garbage dump. 150 people we gathered. And Josefa, you can do this. Even if it's just 30 seconds. Next time, it'll be like a minute. But just tell them what's on your heart, what Jesus did in your life. So she grabs a, a microphone. And she started to not only give her testimony, she started to preach. It lasted 30 minutes. And she gave an altar call. And people came to know the Lord. But in her testimony... In those 30 minutes, my wife and our, our students are, was in awe of what she, she said. She stood up there in front of people from a garbage dump and said, I grew up like you, but my childhood was so much different. She goes on to explain that her mom was a prostitute that would sleep with clients instead of pick up trash. And one day, after she slept with a client, nine months later, she was born. And when she was eight days old, eight days old, her mom threw her away in the garbage dump. Did not want her. Praise God, someone heard her crying in the garbage dump. Another lady rescued her and found her grandmother. So she was raised in her grandmother's house. When she was eight years old, she was forced to go to a feeding center, one of our feeding centers, to get food. And that's where she heard about Jesus. And that's where she got saved. And when she was 10 years old, she got her first Bible from the feeding center. And she started reading it. She realized that she was made for a purpose, that God has a plan for her. And that, that God can heal her, touch her heart that was broken. That can restore. Because there's a lot of things that she had questions about. And she started praying every night that God will restore her relationship with her mother. That her mother will come back. 
okay? And when she was 12 years old, there was a knock on the shack or a clap. And her grandmother said, told Josefa, stay inside, don't come out. But her being 12 years old, she was kind of like, what's going on? And there she saw her grandmother arguing with this lady, which turned out to be her biological mother. And Josefa got so excited. It's like, oh, God has answered my prayer. My mom is coming back. And the grandmother told her, Josefa, do not go with her. She, she's no good. I can, you can't trust her. She's not good for you. Do not go with her. But her biological mother, Josefa, I love you. Come back with me. So Josefa left with her mom. But something inside her grandmother's heart didn't feel right. So the grandmother went to the local authorities and explained the situation about Josefa being taken away by her mother. But her mother was up to no good, she felt. So the police went to a local brothel, just 10 minutes away, the closest brothel to that, that where they lived. And sure enough, around 10, 15 minutes later, Josefa's mom was walking Josefa straight into the brothel to sell her. But thank God, the police was right there. They rescued her. She was never trafficked. No harm was done to her at all. And she was brought back to the grandmother. She was rescued. But Josefa was so broken, so hurt again. So she opened up the Bible and said, God, you heal me once. You touch me once, you can touch me again. And she opened up to Jeremiah 29, 11, how God has a plan for her, a hope and a future. And now, Josefa, at age 14 today, she has a kids' church that she leads every Sunday with like 140 kids in it. And every Saturday, because she has confidence now to speak with older people, she's out on the streets on every Saturday teaching and preaching to the people on the streets, the teenagers. And this is some of the roughest areas in the whole country. Around 100 people come out every Saturday to hear her preach. This is a 14-year-old. And I've seen it. I've been to uh, Kosova on a missions trip. And I saw a pastor. He was like 10 years old, a little boy, preaching. God is doing something in Nicaragua. And it's about Jesus. Because Jesus is passing by. And saying, take heart. Rise up. I am calling you. And he's telling you tonight in this church, Next Generation Church, which I am so honored to be in front of you, that God is going to use this church in a mighty, mighty way to have hope rise up. Rise up. Because God is calling you to greater things that you can possibly imagine or understand. My wife and I went to Nicaragua 10 years ago simply knowing that God called us there. But what to do, we don't know. <laughs> but now, we have a study abroad program. Now, we build churches. Now, we feed over 38,000 kids. Now, we're trying to disciple them. You know, we get kids back in school. It's not us. God's doing a new thing. And what's exciting is, God has saved the best for last. What, I, what do I mean by that? It's us in this room. Nothing takes God by surprise. He knew that you were going to be here tonight. You know? He could have had Abraham, Joseph, David, Paul be alive now. Right? Can you imagine Moses right now being alive in 2017? You know, let my people go. You know? <laughs> but um, they had their opportunity. God has given us our opportunity. He allowed us to be born for such a time as this. Not just solely sit in these chairs and just gather on the weekends and service times. But to go out and tell people about the hope we have in Christ. Because he's not done. And now, um, we have one more video we're going to show. It's what... We came back to the States for four months to raise money for this project. 
And uh, after you watch this video, I'll, I'll explain. Hi, I'm Missionary Kendra Bell in Nicaragua. And today we have the awesome opportunity to tell you what God has been doing here. God has given us and opened up the door for 26 acres of land where we are going to build a camp, a place of refuge, and a place of hope for children. We need your help. We want to partner together to see 10 cabins, just like this one behind us, be built. Not just cabins, we need a well, and we also need a camp that's fun. We need a pool, a baseball diamond, a volleyball court, uh, a soccer field. These are things that we want to be able to have kids come in from all over Nicaragua to be able to experience Christ's love for the first time in a real way. We feed 28,000 kids every day in Nicaragua. Kids that have greater trials and tragedies every day of their life than any of us could imagine. We want to bless them. We want to share Christ's love with them. We want a place to bring them to, a place of refuge and a place of hope. Will you help us make that happen? We need construction teams, and we're looking for people to help us to donate towards the construction of these cabins that we're in the process of building. And we want you to be a part of what God is doing here. We give him all the glory and all the honor for everything that he's done in this place, and we're excited to be able to share with you the testimonies of the great things that God's going to do in the lives of these young children transforming them and preparing them to follow him for the rest of their day. Thanks and God bless. Some of you guys came to Nicaragua and you guys did a camp for one of our feeding programs. Loved all those kids for two nights, three days. And saw the joy in their hearts, you know, when, how they're taken away from what they're used to and being loved on. Those kids in Nicaragua are forced to grow up so quick. And it's by our desire, God has placed in our heart, we bought 26 acres of land. We're building a camp so we can have camp year-round to take those kids from our feeding program. So they can just be kids. Not only that, so Jesus can touch their heart. It reminds me of another story in the Bible about a blind guy. Do you guys remember the story in the Bible where Jesus takes the hand of a blind guy and leads him outside his village and then Jesus spits in his eyes? Okay? And Jesus goes, what do you see? I see people that look like trees. Then once again, Jesus touched them. Isn't it awesome? Jesus touches us. And he saw all things clearly. It was when the blind guy was outside his comfort zone, right? Something happens when you get away from your comfort zone when Jesus touches our lives. So we want to take kids from our feeding programs to do camp. Who knows what, how God's going to use that land? Maybe at a tech school, teach the boys how to weld, auto mechanics, how to sew, teach them English. If you have a Discover credit card in your wallet, and you call the number in the back, you're not calling someone in India, you're calling someone in Nicaragua. <laughs> so if you know English in Nicaragua, you can get some good paying jobs and helping them rise up, right? Because some of them, we get kids back into school, but they're 13, 14 years old, they don't know how to read and write. And they're in a classroom with 40 other kids, they're all younger, and they're really discouraged. And mom's like, don't go to school, help me make tortillas, you know? Um, and so what's really neat is that God's going to help rise, raise up a generation in Nicaragua that might be teachers or doctors or politicians or whatever they want to be. They can dream big dreams. Because for most of them, they've been oppressed. They were told they can't dream big dreams. That's what type of government is in Nicaragua. Okay? Daniel Ortega, the current president, was the president of Nicaragua in the early 80s. Okay? Um, president Reagan of the United States was part of getting Ortega out of office in the early 80s. Um, the whole Oliver North Iran Contra, if you know U.S. history, um, but he went to prison for some wartime crimes, but then he became president again in 2005, and he's still the current president. That's why what happened last year was like, oh, that's interesting, okay? And why am I bringing some history up? And this being a Russian church, you guys can probably give me a history lesson of what a, a press government can do to a society. All I can tell you tonight is, I have a U.S. passport. There are some countries in this world I cannot go to because I'm a U.S. citizen. It's just fact. They don't like citizens of the United States, so they say, no, you cannot come into my country, right? 
But you know what's really cool? Those same countries that say no to U.S. citizens say yes to Nicaraguans. Why? Because those same countries are buddy buddies with the government of Nicaragua. So can you, just like Maximo's story, how he got healed, and all of a sudden, multiple healings, multiple salvation, now there's a church. Can you imagine the impact of a camp, year-round camps, of kids being allowed to dream big dreams for God? You know? Like, you can be whatever you want to be. Jeremiah 20 and 11. Dream big dreams. And they feel called to be a missionary. I want to be, I want to be a missionary like those sweaty Russians that came in 2016. Because <laughs> you go, it's so hot there. You, know? <laughs> you guys just come and sweat. Um, but, um, and they can go to countries where I can't go to. That's just really cool. So maybe Moses, you know, he was in a little basket and God used him, right, to lead the Israelite out of slavery and out of Egypt. Maybe a little Nicaraguan kid that was born in a dump by a 13-year-old mother who was just trying to survive. And God has taken that little boy from a dump, put a call on his life to go to the ends of the world to bring in the last harvest. God doesn't make a mistake. He could have had Abraham be born now. But instead, he had Josepha. He had Maximo. He had you guys. People for such a time as this. So thank you so much for loving missions. Pray for your missionaries that come to your church. Continue to support missionaries. And if you have an opportunity to go on a missions trip, I, I would encourage you all to consider going and to get outside what you're used to and let God touch your life. And thank you so much for allowing me to be here to share a little, just a little bit about Nicaragua. We have a website you can find out on our prayer card and on it are stories, testimonies. My, my wife typed out, and she's a way better storyteller. I am so sorry <laughs> that you only got vanilla tonight. Um, but um, it's just an honor to be here. Thank you so much for praying for us. I just want to close by praying for you, okay? Will you bow your heads and I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this next generation church, for each and every person in this room tonight. Lord, you know their story. You know their life. You know their hurts and their pain. Wrap your mighty arms of love around each and every person in this room tonight. Father God, I pray once again, Lord, that they will be desperate for you. Like the blind guy outside Jericho, Lord, they will cry out for you no matter what. Father God, they will be desperate for you. And Father God, we thank you that you love us so much that you want to touch us. Yes, you died on the cross. And three days later, you rose from the grave. And yes, Lord, the same power that rose Christ from the grave lives inside us to give us life. But Lord, you want to touch us today. So I pray in the name of Jesus, the one who are here now that needs a physical touch, touch them. The ones that are here tonight that may be just down and out, a little depressed, give them joy. Give them peace. Be the lifter of their heads, Lord. Father God, the ones who are here tonight that maybe have stopped dreaming, or have this victim mentality, Lord. Help them to rise up and dream big dreams for you. Use them mightily, Father God. Bless their homes, their marriages, their work, Lord. Let their favor of God rest upon them. I allow them to walk with confidence because we are more than conquerors, Father God. Oh, Father God, thank you for what you're doing in this church. Continue to use this church for your glory. And Lord, there's a, there's a saying that the, the opportunity of the lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. So help us, Father God, to seize each and every opportunity that you have given us to live for you, to shine your light. Let it be a light on the hill. Oh, Father God, be glorified with the things we say and do. We thank you, Lord, for the kingdom of God. Thank you, Father God, for touching my heart for calling me to full-time mission work when I was in Russia, Lord. 
Oh, continue to raise up missionaries and pastors and teachers and leaders and lawyers and doctors and nurses out of this church for your glory. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.